will hear a man phoning a woman about an advertisement he has seen in the paper for some furniture. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the advertisement in yesterday's newspaper, the one for the bookcases. Can you tell me if they're still available? We've sold one, but we still have two available. Right. Um, can you tell me a bit about them? Sure. Um, what do you want to know? Well, I'm looking for something to fit in my study. So, well, I'm not too worried about the height, but the width's quite important. Can you tell me how wide each of them is? They're both exactly the same size. Let me see. I've got the details written down somewhere. Yes. So they're both 75 centimetres wide and 180 centimetres high. OK, fine. That should fit in OK. And I don't want anything that looks too severe. Not made of metal, for example. I was really looking for something made of wood. That's all right. They are, both of them. So are they both the same price as well? No, the first bookcase is quite a bit cheaper. It's just £15. Pounds. We paid £60 pounds for it just five years ago, so it's very good value. It's in perfectly good condition. Well, they're both in very good condition, in fact. But the first one isn't the same quality as the other one. It's a good sturdy bookcase. It used to be in my son's room, but it could do with a fresh coat of paint. Oh, it's painted? Yes, it's cream at present. But as I say, you could easily change that if you wanted. To fit in with your colour scheme? Yes. I'd probably paint it white if I got it. Let's see. What else? How many shelves has it got? Six. Two of them are fixed, and the other four are adjustable, so you can shift them up and down according to the sizes of your books. Right. Fine. Well, that certainly sounds like a possibility. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. But the second one's a lovely bookcase too. That's not painted, it's just the natural wood colour, dark brown. It was my grandmother's, and I think she bought it sometime in the 1930s. So I'd say it must be getting on for 80 years old. So it's very good quality. They don't make them like that nowadays. And you said it's the same dimensions as the first one? Yes. And it's got the six shelves, but it also has a cupboard at the bottom that's really useful for keeping odds and ends in. Right. Oh, and I nearly forgot to say, the other thing about it is it's got glass doors, so the books are all kept out of the dust. So it's really good value for the money. I'm really sorry to be selling it, but we just don't have the room for it. Hmm. So what are you asking for that one? Ninety-five pounds. It's quite a bit more, but it's a lovely piece of furniture. A real heirloom. Yes. All the same, it's a lot more than I wanted to pay. I didn't really want to go above 30 or 40. Anyway, the first one sounds fine for what I need. Just as you like. So, 
Is it all right if I come round and have a look this evening? Then, if it's okay, I can take it away with me. Of course. So you'll be coming by car, will you? I've got a friend with a van, so I'll get him to bring me round. If you can just give me the details of where you live. Sure. I'm Mrs. Blake. B L A K E. That's right. And the address is Forty One Oak Rise. That's in Stanton. Okay. So I'll be coming from the town centre. Can you give me an idea of where you are? Yes. You know the road that goes out towards the university. Yes. Well, you take that road, and you go on till you get to a roundabout. Go straight on, then Oak Rise is the first road to the right. Out towards the university, past the roundabout, first left. First right, and we're at the end of the road. Got it. So I'll be round at about seven, if that's all right. Oh, and my name's Connor, Connor Field. Fine. I'll see you then, Connor. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speaker talking about saving energy in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to twelve. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 12. Many thanks for inviting me along to talk about saving energy in the home. This is a key issue for many people who now find themselves on tight budgets. So today I'd like to spend a few minutes going through some simple tips to help keep those energy bills to a minimum. I'll start with some easy, cheap ideas before talking about more major solutions later. I think we're all aware of the importance of insulating our homes, and although I'd advise you to get it done, I appreciate it can sometimes be inconvenient to have building work carried out. And though they're growing in popularity, having solar panels installed on the roof isn't a cheap enough option for many of us to consider seriously. So what other steps can we take? Well, most people will make a point of turning the heating down when temperatures outside rise, but they ignore other equally useful ways of saving energy when they're making dinner or doing their weekly laundry. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. If you're living in a relatively new apartment or house, you're probably blessed with a cosy, draft-free living space. But for those of us in older properties, the chances are there are gaps all over the place where cold air is getting in. Walk around your home and place the back of your hand around window frames. Can you feel cold air coming in from outside? 
Get down on your knees at the doors. Is there a draft at floor level? Fix these drafts with some cheap draft excluders and savings in heating bills will begin straight away. And are you using the latest energy-saving light bulbs? I'm not recommending you go around your entire property throwing out older ones and replacing them all immediately. But next time a bulb goes, make sure you buy an energy-efficient alternative. And what about heating? If you have radiators in every room, do you need them all switched on throughout the day? If they're on timers, set them efficiently. Then there's the laptop or your TV. Do you leave them switched on overnight or on standby? Don't waste money. Turn them off. And that goes for lights as well. You'd be surprised how many people leave them on when they go out. There are also guaranteed savings to be made in the kitchen. I'm always telling my husband not to overfill the kettle when he makes a cup of tea. Why boil more water than you actually need? When you consider how many times that kettle gets used every day, you'll appreciate just how much electricity can be saved by boiling what you need and no more. And the next time you're cooking pasta or potatoes, keep a lid on the pot. The water will boil much more quickly than if you leave it off. And if you've bought yourself a pressure cooker or steamer and it's sitting in the cupboard never being used, get it out. They're much more efficient than pots and pans. Now, the refrigerator and freezer. If the fridge is next to the cooker, it's having to work harder to stay cold. But as I'm giving cheap, easy solutions here, a kitchen redesign might be out of the question. Still, there are other energy-saving steps you can take. Keep an eye on the temperature control. We often forget to turn it down in the colder winter months when a high setting is unnecessary. Also, remember to defrost the freezer frequently and try not to overfill it, as this isn't the most efficient way of using it. The washing machine is another potential money saver. A lot of people wash at 40 degrees Celsius, but it's often okay to drop the temperature down to 30 degrees Celsius with similar results. And remember to either wash full loads or select the half load program. Again, a surprising number of people forget to do this. And is it really necessary to dry your clothes in a tumble dryer? If you have a garden or a yard, hang them outside. Or if you're drying them inside, get yourself a cheap clothes rail rather than hanging things over radiators, which robs you of valuable heat. Now, let's turn to some of the help our local council is offering to householders to save energy. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average, I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested, 
and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock, it's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it. And we'll just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on Life at Work, 
which is being given as part of a series of lectures on productivity and work practices. First, look at questions 31 to 35. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good afternoon. My name is Dr Charles Butt and I shall be giving you a series of lectures on productivity and work practices over the coming weeks. There will be ten lectures in the mornings as part of this course, and in addition there will be three lectures in the evenings from six to eight, which will be given by outside speakers. I would like first to look at a recent report on life at work. The report shows that the average British worker takes less than half an hour for lunch, 27 minutes to be precise, and that sick leave is on the increase. The drop in the length of time spent on lunch was 9 minutes when compared to last year, down from 36 minutes. According to the report, this is the first time that the average lunch break has fallen below half an hour. As regards sick leave, you can see that the average figure is 10 days per year. That's up by one day in 2002 compared to 2001. While physical illness was given as the most common reason for absence in the case of non-manual workers, stress was the most common cause of long-term absence. It's worth noting here that 9 out of 10 workers claim that stress is a problem in their organisation and that 8 out of 10 bosses are feeling more stressed than ever before. I would just like to say here that we will be looking at the stress in work and study at a later date. And we'll be looking particularly at ways of dealing with it in studying, particularly for exams. You can see from the calendar that Professor Appleyard will be giving a lecture on this topic the week after next. The report also says that just below 50% of workers claim that they were taking less time off for holidays than they were entitled to. I'm not sure that this will be believed by the employers. Previous surveys have suggested that about one-third of days that have been taken by workers as days off sick were regarded by bosses as not being the result of genuine illness. Some more hard data is required to corroborate both these claims. Before the speaker continues, look at questions 36 to 40. As you listen, answer questions 36 to 40. All this suggests that employers are driving their workers too hard. The effects of overworking mean that workers are now being stretched beyond their limits, both physically and mentally. This is borne out by the increase in sick leave. However, Looked at from the employer's point of view, the picture may not be the same. Employers say that workers protest too much, but bearing in mind the data about the number of bosses feeling much more stress than before, we need to think about this carefully. It's interesting to note that productivity has gone up in many areas of industry. In 2001, the local car plant had one of the sharpest increases in average productivity, with the number of vehicles per employee rising by over 30% a year. 
A new assembly line came into operation at the beginning of 2002, affecting productivity, which increased to the 100 vehicles per worker mark by the end of the year. This is a stunning achievement for an industry which was not long ago considered to be collapsing. It would be interesting to do a survey of the work life at the plant. Those of you who have opted to do the project and reduce the number of essays you have to do may want to look into this. Please see me at the end of the lecture. Right, now, let us move on to something else which I think... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.